quick one today. We're going to delve into a subject that I sometimes get questions about, and it's related to people who are building their very first guitar and feeling anxious about dialing in a proper setup when it's their first time. This happens more than you might suspect. Building a guitar, especially an acoustic, if you've never tried it, requires an almost insurmountable number of steps. If you were to make a checklist of all the things that need doing, you'd end up with a booklet that rivals your average Stephen King novella. And when you start to contemplate that one individual step in that process can have profound effects pages and pages down the road, it really does get scary. And a lot of people suffer a kind of executive paralysis. You know, if you make one little mistake now, you feel you're doomed, and it's not worth going on. This is why it's very rare for people to build an acoustic guitar without some kind of guidance or tuition. You can read all the steps in a book, but it just becomes too daunting. It overloads your brain. Things have changed a little bit in recent years with online courses like Robbie O'Brien's, which endeavor to break it down step by step. Still, it's a long, hard road. And big respect to anyone who's taught themselves how to do this kind of thing on their kitchen table. This is a guitar that was completed about five years ago by a regular customer of mine, and he did it as part of a course at the local community college, Mohawk College. They asked me if I was interested in teaching there a while back, but I couldn't at the time. And in the interim, I think the course has been cancelled or fallen by the wayside. A bunch of cuts up there recently to arts-related programs. I think Dan Minton was teaching. Dan's a good guy. Anyway, this shows all the hallmarks of a first build. This is a very familiar design, and it's got simple appointments, which is probably the best way to start. A lot of people want to reinvent the wheel their first go around. And that can be difficult. It's tricky because there's no benchmark for success if it's a design that's never been done before. Um, you can tell a good dreadnought when you play it, right? So you know if you're on the right path. If it's your first guitar, you should probably reconcile yourself with the fact that the neck is probably going to end up a bit chunky. It's a natural thing. Uh, it happens almost every time. You know, the beginner has a fear of cutting or sanding too far. You know that there's a truss rod in the middle of this neck somewhere, and you, you really don't want to ruin this $100 piece of mahogany by cutting into it. Right? That's a serious calamity. It's one of the main things gained with experience, just how far to thin something before we start sanding it. Or the opposite happens, unfortunately. Things like braces will end up too short, or the sides will end up too thin, or something is cut too deeply and everything else around it needs to be sanded down to that level, so we end up with structural failure on occasion. Usually thicker is better than too thin. And I think the thing that holds the most trepidation for most beginners, after maybe bending the sides, is doing the setup. Because it comes at a point where so much work has been invested that a blunder at that point would be emotionally crushing. You know, it's the point where the end is in sight, and if you have to back up a few steps, then oh boy, you know, you just want to get those strings on so you can play the darn thing. So often, things like action end up being about 10% too high. Also, in a classroom setting, you got other people around you stringing up. You know, they got those broad, beaming smiles as they play their first intoxicating chords, and you must join them, you know? So you put the strings on, figuring that you'll refine it later, but it never happens. Speaking to that rush to get to the finish line, this still has the plastic on top of the truss rod cover, which I think is wonderful. I won't be the one to pull that off. Things like the nut slot height ends up being a bit too high because you're certainly not going to cut it too low. That would be a real problem, wouldn't it? Um, this player wants a professional setup as the crowning touch. Most of the time, I encourage people to get there themselves if they can, because that's sort of, you know, the end game of the whole experience. But if you haven't invested in the tools you need to do things like nut slotting, or you realize that this just is not for you, you're never going to build another one, well, how do you proceed? So, you know, we're going to make this play as well as I can possibly make it play. I'm just going to point out a few of the tiny little disasters that happened along the way not because I want to disrespect the maker. Not at all. I want to commiserate with the first-time builders out there and point out 
What's going to happen? And what needs to be taken in stride, or you'd never get it done. So many people can't get past these things, and they never complete their first build because of the mental anguish involved. Um, things like routing for binding. There are going to be little slip-ups and misfittings, and if you're not intimately related to a router, you're going to go backwards against the grain in a place that's unsupported, and then boom, chunks fly off. That would have been a bad moment. It would have been really heart-rending. You know, there are tricks to doing accurate binding channels and fitting it, but they all require experience. You got to go through a few of these things. And this is just a cosmetic thing. At some point we'll have a look at my first guitar, which is in pretty bad shape right now because it got stored without a case for a couple of decades. I had to sell it with another guitar I built and I didn't have an extra hundred bucks hanging around. We'll fix it up. We'll do a few things to it. Finish work is really tough for the beginner. And this has a satin lacquer finish, which is amazing. It's pretty cool. It's actually more difficult to get right than a glossy lacquer because you're not touching it after it's been sprayed. What comes out of the gun is what it's going to be, you know? And there's some little marks from sanding through the sealer coat or maybe a couple little glue splotches or something that don't show up until you put the top coats on. What are you going to do? Sand everything back to bare wood and start over? Or are you just going to get the thing done? If you expect perfection in your first guitar, you're never going to be satisfied. You have to think of it as a learning process. And this thing is as good or better than 90% of the first instruments I've seen. Most of us don't get comfortable until we've got maybe 10 or 12 of them under our belts. We accumulate intuition. We've seen those trouble spots before and we know to look out for them. So don't be too self-deprecating about your first instruments. The fact that you've finished something so complex the average person can't comprehend it is enough. They, they can't understand this. And the people who can understand it are going to nod their heads because they've been through it with you. They know what you went through to make this thing. A working guitar is a heck of a piece of artistic engineering. So if you've made one, be proud. Okay, we'll start like we always do by looking at the action height. We've got 8 64ths on the bass side, and about 6.5 on the treble, which would be about 3.1 millimeters and 2.6, which, like we thought, is high. That would be the absolute highest we would consider normal on the bass side, and I think higher than it needs to be definitely on the treble. Up next, we're going to check the amount of relief in the neck, or the amount of bow. I've got my capo on the first fret. I'm going to hold down the sixth string around the body joint and using a set of automotive feeler gauges. These are just very thin pieces of metal which have been accurately sized. Um, I'm going to check around the 6th, 7th fret. And I see that i got about 14 thousandths, which would be like 0.32 millimeters, which uh, is about twice what I want to see. Uh, definitely on an acoustic guitar, I want to see less than 10 thousandths of an inch. Ideally, a Martin-style guitar, I'd see around 5 thousandths. It's not always possible, but that's what I want. Okay, when I see a standard hex key and a modern truss rod, I'm going to assume 4 millimeters first off, but it might not be. Okay, so 4 millimeters fits. It's a little bit loose. I could probably make it work, but odds are that this is not 4 millimeters. It's 530 seconds, the imperial measurement, which is just slightly more than 4 millimeters. Yes, that fits more like it. So, 530 seconds. Back it off a little bit to start off with. People ask if it's okay to adjust a truss rod with strings on. Yeah, it's no problem. So, I know I need to move it a little bit more than a schmidge, so I'm going to give it... That's almost a quarter turn. We'll see what that does. Now, before I measure, I'm going to sort of massage the neck, bending it backwards and forwards slightly, and if there's any point at which the rod is hung up inside the channel, which it's sitting in, this should help it slip past that and actually do its thing. Okay, so we're down to 8 64ths. We're going to need another little turn. Okay, a little bit more. Massage it again, and try again. And we come up with about 5 64ths, which is great. <laughs> 
Again, adjusting the truss rod is not really about the action, but it can have a beneficial side effect. It's about straightening the neck. They're two different things. Got seven and a half sixty-fourths on the base side, and just over six on the treble. Having straightened the neck, we can move on to the nut slots. And checking on the low E string here, we seem to have something that is probably 26, 27 thousandths clearance between the bottom of the string and the top of the first fret, which is more than it needs to be. I'd like to see that somewhere around 21 or 22 thousandths. And it seems like the other strings are about the same. For someone getting into guitar repair specifically, um, a good set of nut files is probably the most expensive thing you'll have to outlay for initially. Um, there are inexpensive Chinese versions available on Amazon and other sites which are not good. Uh, really not worth the money that you save. Some of them are absolutely non-functional. I bought a set of base files for base nuts and unusable. So it pays. You gotta buy the good ones. So the nut slot should basically follow the angle of the headstock. However, I make mine slightly rounded up to the front edge. Do the initial shaping, pop the string back in place. Yes, there are ways of doing this where you don't have to detune the string. I don't use them, especially when I'm making a video. I can test by feel or I can sight the air gap between the two parts, which if you've got some experience works well. Uh, otherwise, otherwise the feeler gauge comes in handy here. And yeah, we're sitting about 22 thousandths of an inch off the top of the fret. Now I'm going to polish the slot itself using some 600 and 1200 grit wet dry sandpaper. This gives you a really nice smooth slot for the string to travel through. The other thing I'm going to do is lightly chamfer the back end of the nut, especially in the direction the string has to travel to reach the tuner. And this will ease its introduction into the nut and prevent the string from getting stuck there. It just makes for smoother tuning. Another thing to be cognizant of is string spacing. Looking at this, this is not too bad. Um, there is a slightly wider gap between the D and the G strings uh, than, for instance, the D and the A. So at this stage, because I have to take the slots down a bit, I can also influence them slightly towards each other at this point by filing at a slight angle. I'm also slightly influencing the string towards the post via the slot itself. Uh, the slot's at an angle and the file is held at an angle, so I'm going to end up with tighter spacing and also slightly more angled string. The string slots are deeper than they need to be now, so I can remove some of the excess height from the nut. We really only need about half the string diameter under the surface of the nut. I'm holding my file at a slight angle, again to mimic the headstock. It's actually sort of halfway between the headstock angle and the fingerboard. Uh, and I'm using a draw filing motion, so I'm going side to side as opposed to... I suppose I can do that, but I find it's easier to maintain the shape of the nut if I go side to side. Sand the surface of the nut. Give it a light polish. And get rid of any file marks. And the last thing I'll do is use a little bit of number two or HB pencil lead in the slots. This is not, of course, lead. It's actually graphite. And this works very well as a lubricant. Now, just through the other parts of the setup, never having touched the saddle, we're down to 7 64ths and 6 64ths. Maybe we've got plenty of saddle height to work with. We're going to take that down by about 3 64ths of an inch, which should end up giving us an action height of around 5 and a half 64ths on the base, around 4 and a half on the treble. Uh, however, the saddle also appears slightly narrow for the slot that it's in. We're going to measure that and see what we can do. Keep tabs on the order of the bridge pins as they come out. Especially in a luthier built guitar, 
these will have been fit specifically to their holes and if you mix them up it doesn't seem like there's a huge amount of variation but there can be so best to keep them in order save yourself time and tears pulling the strings out here some of them are kind of caught in a bunch of splinters that are on the underside of the bridge pad rather than splinters it turned out to be a piece of tape this is not at all unusual I've worked on guitars which are between 35 and 50 years old, which have had tape stuck to the bottom of the bridge plate the entire time. Sometimes, however, this kind of thing can cause a strange and very annoying little buzz, which you'll hear in the background of every note you play, and you'll always wonder why. And, yeah, saddle's a bit loose. You know, measure the saddle slot width here. It seems to be about... 110 thousandths wide. Yeah, it varies a little bit. And this saddle is around 95 thousandths. Uh, also, gets thicker at one end. So, sometimes I would use a little bit of super glue on the back side of the saddle, and that would take up some of this extra room, but in this case there's too much to do that, so I'll be making a new saddle. I cut it to length and round it over the ends, and now it's snug enough to lift the instrument. It'll still be removed by fingertips. I'll measure the high point of the saddle, realizing it's going to be too tall. It'll give me more room to work with. And I'll put on a radius here. Uh, it's actually going to be slightly looser than 16. It's probably going to be about 18 inch radius when I'm done. That accounts for the fact that we usually want the action to be slightly lower on the treble side than the bass, and having the flatter radius kind of naturally does that for us without having the interior strings, the G and the D, too high off the fretboard, or higher than is necessary, um, because we're going to be sort of tilting that arc in relation to the fretboard. Checking the intonation points with a bent piece of string here, making the octave sound the same as the open string. Yeah, the fret ends just on the corners are a little bit sharp, and this usually happens after the first winter when a guitar neck settles in. It'll shrink ever so slightly, leaving these protruding enough that it feels uncomfortable. So it's not uncommon and basically routine to have to come back and touch these up. Just take care of that sharp little edge. Just lightly blend those with some fine sandpaper. One last step. I don't believe this fingerboard has had any oil on it at all. It seems raw and very dry. This doesn't look like a rosewood to me. Uh, could be something like Chechen, but I bet if we add some light penetrating oil, this is a drying oil, a Danish oil. Um, you don't usually see me putting this on the standard um, setup fretboard, but as a first application this will lightly seal the wood and bring up some of this darker, more pleasant color. Yeah, that looks very nice. Same thing for the bridge. It looks slightly anemic at the moment. A little of this on there. Okay, fresh set of strings and we're all ready to go. You know, it's those final little details that really kind of separate a guitar from the that's okay to one I really want to play category, you know? With the adjustment we've made, we've actually lowered the action a full 25%. And it's much more comfortable and easier to play in the lower positions, and it's playing in tune better with itself. So let's put it through some paces. Mm -hmm. 